Alive. So, Benjamin, I was telling you, I was in Italy and uh, I got two um, meetings that was really um, crazy for me. One was on a taxi and one was uh, a guy who stopped me in the street. I have some following in Italy, so sometimes people stop me for, you know, a selfie or say hi. And uh, the taxi driver, I told you, he, he was talking about... Uh, his crypto investments and asking me for advice. And I say, man, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I was really surprised that a taxi driver was into crypto. And the other guy who stopped me in Rome, I thought, okay, he won the classic selfie. No, no. He said, so what do you think? Uh, we're doing some interesting NFT projects here and I would like to have your opinion. And I thought, am I in a parallel universe i'm already in the metaverse maybe i'm is is that a matrix what's going on so uh, that was incredible for me and i don't know if it's something that happens to you often but uh, it's probably a signal that something is happening up hour speciale crypto è organizzato da up gang e marco montemagno in collaborazione con leontech con una diversificata gamma di oltre 800 certificati quotati in Italia, Leontech offre soluzioni di investimento adatte ad ogni risparmiatore. Visita il sito certificati.leontech.com, esplora un universo di prodotti e seleziona quelli più adatti alle tue esigenze. Leontech, tecnologia ed innovazione al servizio del tuo portafoglio. Sì, yeah, totally. I, I think uh, we're at the tipping point, right before the tipping point of a very, very significant revolution, perhaps uh, one of the most um, important um, innovations and technologies since the invention of the internet is now live and enables people from all, all around the world to essentially participate in an economy um, in a way that they never could before. And um, this, this, I think, has to do with two, two elements. So web, this idea called Web3, enabled by blockchain technologies, um, is, is the idea that whereas in the Web2, where the entire internet is essentially uh, owned by four or five large corporations and, and people are just there sharing their, their data and information and so forth, in Web3, um, you have the internet owned by users and builders orchestrated mm. with tokens. So this idea that people from all over the world can own a piece of the internet is exhilarating. Right. I mean, yeah. when people discover something like this, they want to de dig deeper. And of course, you'll have many, many projects um, attempting to... Um, create something more useful, more interesting. But if you look at it from, from um, let's say, macro overview, it seems like this may well be the most important um, opportunity of our generation, uh, both in impact and in economic upside. And we can, we can basically dive in a few things. So what blockchains do and where are we? On, on this time frame, uh, what is Web3 and, and some of its implications, NFTs, Metaverse, and DeFi, for instance, and uh, maybe how Elrond ties into all of this. H But uh, yeah, that, 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 I think that, that that's the main, the main point. Uh, help us to understand what Elrond um, um, is doing for people who are maybe not aware of the, of the project. Uh, And what's also the difference if um, people say, you know, other blockchains, there is Ethereum, there are different ones. Uh, so why Elrond is different? Sure. The, the goal of Elrond is to create the backbone for a high bandwidth, low latency and transparent financial system, and then give anyone anywhere easy access to this financial system. Um, and the, the basic idea is essentially this. Um, we currently have a financial system that is based on outdated technology and essentially perverse incentives. So there's a lot of inefficiency, both in developed countries and in developing countries. And then the second problem uh, that ties immediately to this is that we still have more than 1.7 billion people around the world that essentially have no 
access to financial infrastructure. So what we're doing with Elrond is um, essentially um, focused on two things. We've built a blockchain architecture that is 1,000 times more advanced in terms of um, throughput, execution speed, and transaction costs compared right. to Bitcoin and Ethereum. What this means is essentially if in Bitcoin you can process something like seven transactions per second and in Ethereum you can process something like 15 transactions per second, in Elrond right now we can process more than 15,000 and we can essentially process more than hundreds of thousands because this is an essentially um, scalable architecture. And then the second element tying to this is a super wallet that we're creating that essentially simplifies the entire interaction with this technology so that users don't have to learn rocket science. Uh, because as cool, the as cool as the technology is, if you have to learn rocket science to use it, then essentially you'll only have five, 10 people that know what yeah. the technology does and use it and so forth. But our core insight and the reason why we're pushing as hard as possible is the idea that if we can bring the next billion people in the blockchain space by simplifying experience and solving the performance problem, we're going to have a very similar moment to that of, on the one hand, the transition from dial-up to broadband um, in performance in the early days of the internet and that of the um, web browser, where essentially everyone in the world could start playing a bit with the technology, exploring and, and um, so forth. So this is extremely exciting. And this is why Elrond is uniquely positioned to, to enable all this uh, revolution. You mentioned the the ease of use and the simplicity um, that, that is very important. And um, I, I give you this example. Um, I think the other day I said, all right, uh, um, what do we need to do if we want to add uh, Michael Saylor style <laughs> micro strategy, some of the balance sheet of the UK LTD company, one uh, LTD company. We want to add um, some money, get Bitcoin as a store value. That's it. Well, I mean, uh, in theory is easy. The truth is that everything is built to make it kind of difficult. It's not impossible. It's just difficult. I mean, you need uh, a, an exchange company business slash enterprise corporate account. Then um, you need to do the KYC. Then you need to move the money from a, a traditional bank that doesn't like to move the money into exchanges. You have to move the money. I mean, is and then you the accountant call you and say, "Well, but now is it? What is it? Is it capital gain? Is it?" And you say, "No, wait, wait, we just want to move, you know, percentage of the money." So everything is built in a way that. It's not so easy. And the same with NFT, you know, easy to buy NFT. Then you try to buy an NFT and connect with MetaMask and people say, what, what? Meta what? I just, I have PayPal or, and so it's uh, at the moment, we are just at the beginning, I think. And we, we need more tools that make it easier. What, what do you think? This is precisely uh, the case. So if you look at things, uh, again, zooming out, uh, you see that there's this tremendous opportunity that philosophically speaking or technologically speaking is quite clear. But then the question is, why are we not there yet? Why is blockchain technology not everywhere adopted already? And what's taking so long? And I think there are two, two um, important problems here that need to be addressed in order for us to see the, the kind of adoption that speaks to some of the challenges that you've just described. One of the challenges is um, a performance challenge. Can we accommodate internet scale performance? Can we really bring businesses and startups on top of the blockchain? And can the blockchain handle this? And here um, Elrond is perhaps the most advanced architecture in, in terms of performance that really brings uh, a new kind of um, level of, um, of performance and processing capacity. And then the second element that 
I think the next period will be about is simplicity. I mean, mm. you can never go simple enough um, with the current phase uh, we are at. And to the extent that we'll be able to simplify things completely so that uh, owning an NFT, exchanging some money, sending it, sending it to any friends we have around the world, to, uh, without thinking about it, just as we send an SMS or just a, as we send an email, to that extent, blockchain will be everywhere. So this is why Mayar, um, as this super wallet that we've created, is essentially just a way that enables you very simply to interact with cryptos, with NFTs, and with um, DeFi. And it's it's not simple at first to build these technologies, but if you think about it um, at its best, the next layer of finance will be just um, people being able to exchange money or send money anywhere in the world in an instant at a fraction of a cost that uh, we, we are paying right now. And if you can do this on top of this, you can do almost everything else that you're thinking about. And this is this is what we're trying to make come true. Got it. You, you've been talking about the metaverse before, and uh, for um, people uh, listening to our conversation that maybe are not aware, uh, recently Mark Zuckerberg changed the name of the company, the holding company, not the product, uh, from Facebook to Meta, uh, obviously with a lot of uh, critics uh, and uh, people say, no, but in uh, this language it means very bad things. You know, I mean, imagine how difficult it is to change the name of a company. I mean, he could have called it Mark and that's it, and that would have been maybe easier. But uh, the, the topic uh, that maybe most of the people missed was that the change is because Facebook is not focused anymore only on social media, but they have uh, virtual reality, they have Oculus, they have uh, the hardware, they launched their glasses, and uh, they are into this metaverse. They are a metaverse first company now. And um, it sounds interesting, but no one understands exactly what this metaverse is. So help us to understand uh, what, what is the, the, the big picture that not only Facebook, but a lot of big tech have at the moment. Sure. The, the idea with the metaverse is that um, it can be several things, uh, but it's, it's something extremely fundamental. Uh, you, you can see the simplest version of a metaverse would be a virtual space that you can create anything into. So whether you, you just want to recreate different parts of the world and give them rules and define those rules and play games in it and, and so forth, this can be a metaverse. Um, on the other hand, uh, you, you can move one step closer to where we are right now. And it's very likely that metaverse will be something like a moment when the digital versions of our identity and realities will start to become more valuable than mm. the real life assets and, and realities that we are, we are built. And this is um, extremely fundamental if you think about it. And then uh, to go to the extreme, a metaverse um, at its best is just uh, the simulation that we're living in. Right. Um, I mean, if you if you think about it uh, and assuming any type of growth uh, in terms of computational power and um, efficiency, video graphics efficiency and so forth, assuming any type of uh, growth, the idea is that at some point we reach a point where the digital realities become indistinguishable from, from oh. the real reality. So, so that, um, let's say that the extreme... Um, version of the metaverse is a so, sort of matrix uh, that 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 where we, we we live our digital life, sort of. Yes, yes, and it, it's the the greatest part of the metaverse is that it's open ended, that we can shape it in whatever way we we believe um, is fit, uh, but it will very much involve probably the most creative 
most brilliant um, artists and smartest technical people from around the world just because you can you can easily play god in a metaverse you can easily create new societies build new cities build new countries and experiment with things that you never could in reality or it could cost too much and so if enough value is built there uh, then people start to come there and live part of their lives or have fun or stuff like that and what's changing right now i think uh, from maybe five years ago or 10 years ago is the fact that for the first time digital assets like real assets are moving to be digital assets and the digital assets the crypto stuff that we have with the blockchain is creating so much value in the digital world that uh, this very much will be like um, a metaverse that becomes much more valuable for for people in in um, in today's world uh, so i i would expect that most people today young people especially will be able to earn earn hundreds of or thousands of times more money in the metaverse than mm. they can earn in real life at this point right. which is right. which is going to be surprising and benjamin why the metaverse which sounds very virtual reality and augmented reality heavy so focus on on that um why and where will meet blockchain and and the crypto world and and, and the nfts uh, well, where is the 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 meeting point between these uh, two technologies sure so the the idea with blockchain is, is that you can see blockchain in a sense like um virtual computers virtual computers that have different primitives they enable you to transfer uh money without the need for trusted th third parties so in automated fashions and so forth but given that they're virtual computers they enable you to encode digital property in a way that is unforgeable just as uh, when you started to have the laws in the real world that granted you property that cannot be taken away and then you had an explosion in the economic sense as a function of being able to own land own some property and so forth um, we're just rediscovering this idea in the digital world because up until this point we could not really own anything in the digital world other than let's say domain names which were owned by us and and so yep. forth um, and now through the blockchain we can own stuff and then the next step is how do we own it well it's through tokens um, that is fungible tokens which is essentially money or any token that can be exchanged with another token this is a fungible token and then non-fungible token are unique tokens that can never be exchanged with a different token um, equally so the idea that you can through tokens basically own a part of the internet is very simple but extremely powerful and then extending this to the metaverse is just that in the metaverse up until this point you could play around build some stuff but you could not capture the value um the the game designers would capture the value and the companies that design the games capture the value but now for the first time you can create a game and enable everyone within the game to have rights to build their stuff own them exchange them for value and and so forth and this um this opens a new phase for the metaverse uh and it's why everyone is extremely extremely excited about it at this point so to give an example i can create my i don't know video game i create wigs <laughs> only people and then i can sell my hair my digital hair uh and uh, i can get money out of it or or, or can become something that is uh um certified that is a unique piece uh, of uh, digital art or or as a specific utility so mm -hmm. but, but you think that is only in video games or as some uh repercussions in for brands for um creators for yeah 
I think it, it, this will probably be the most important revolution for artists um, we've seen in history. Because just le like um, tech startups were for coders, NFTs are for artists all over the world or creators all over the world. Um, it essentially gives you a better expression, a better means of connecting with your community, of sharing ideas and economic value with your community and takes away the intermediaries that would otherwise like cut you through, whether you're a musician, whether you're a writer, a painter or a digital artist in, in, or creator in whatever way. NFTs give you the ultimate way, the simplest way to connect with your community, share value with the, your community. And um, this is why they're, they're super powerful. It goes well beyond the metaverse. Um, it, it, like, this is why um, at first, when you have powerful technologies, people try to replicate what they have in real life. Yeah. Uh, so first you want to replicate what you think uh, you've seen before and you want to move the the art the old artists to the new digital space and you think this this will be the biggest market but when the new technologies come a new market emerges completely new something that you never thought uh, would exist and and so forth of course the old artists also uh, find their way and always um, create new ways for them to to express their value but um yeah the, it, it seems like we're at this unique point when due to crypto blockchains and um nfts and defi and and so forth we're seeing several parts of the um, economy just being absorbed to the digital world and then um, new people starting to play with it. When uh, I talk with someone, with a taxi driver or <laughs> with, with anyone about this topic, at this point of the conversation, I always arrive a couple of critics. First one is, yes, but the regulation. So the, the, they will ban the, the technology, they will governments will never allow this or that. So this is one uh, main issue. And the other issue is climate. So uh, are these technologies sustainable? These blockchains are very environmental unfriendly. You know, th these are the main mm -hmm. um, critics mm -hmm. that, I, that I receive. Uh, how, how do you answer to that? Uh, two points here. The, the great part is that um, Elrond, for instance, is one of the first blockchain blockchains that is fully carbon negative. I mean, not only carbon neutral, but carbon negative. Right. Um, it's it's roughly 36,000 times uh, more efficient than Bitcoin and about um, 12,000 times more efficient than Ethereum. But going even beyond that, we've offset everything and went beyond that so that you can create tokens, you can create NFTs and so forth. And know for certain that they are carbon negative. This right. is a great, important wow. step. Incredible. How, how did you achieve that? Uh, well, th there are some clear ways that you can, for instance, uh, uh, calculate how much you, you uh, have, what carbon footprint you have. You can offset that in several ways and starting to do that as fast as possible, especially as, as a blockchain, um, it's, it's great. This is the last step. And the first step actually was the most difficult, creating an architecture from scratch that has moved away from proof of work and has built on proof of stake, which is this very different idea where you don't have to have an arms race of computational resources so that people get faster and faster computers because otherwise they cannot earn any money in, for instance, Bitcoin. Right. Um, and um, the, the, the good news is we've seen a tremendous change even in the Bitcoin space and in the Ethereum space. So everyone is moving toward proof of stake on the one hand, and then people are moving even beyond that to, to offset their car carbon footprint. And um, the, to, to your first question, the idea with regulation is that we've seen several moments throughout history when 
new and important technologies have come and we know that regulation usually comes after the technology um, the smartest countries will never try to regulate to death a technology that they see will bring a lot of value to the entire economy because again if we think about it fundamentally everyone um, any government any central bank any commercial bank or any user from around the world will want services or a world in which they can transfer money in an instant with a trivial cost anywhere in the world like this is uh, this is of no discussion and then the question is how do you do it in a way that's compliant that is not uh, 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 getting into fights, unnecessary fights with the governments or with the central bank. And um, here we're very proactive, um, engaging in all kinds of conversations with the different governments and central banks and um, commercial banks. And we always like to underscore that this is not a zero sum game. It's not like someone stealing from someone else and this is why we have to fight. Um, this is this is the smallest version of uh, what people see right now. The most important thing to to realize is that here we're building something from scratch, from zero. It's like we're creating a new universe that will create more value for the different countries, more value for the governments, for the central banks. But it's still up to them to open the eyes start exploring start learning about the technology and we're quite happy and excited to have these conversations with them also i think uh, that when people think about regulation they probably confuse uh, crypto as a unique object when crypto is like say internet what what are we talking exactly. about are we talking about e-commerce are we talking about dating apps what, what are we talking about so um, i i think that we already have some answers for instance bitcoin uh, etf has been approved in us the sec say well not ban because so i mean there are already a lot of indications and on the other side projects that are not good scams they they will be uh, hopefully sure um yeah devastated by by regulation and and it is a good thing so like a, a internet at the beginning i think yeah and and two things i would note here first um we're at a point where if you think about it even the internet has been questioned at the beginning yeah. and it's yeah. funny to think that anyone in their right mind would say that the internet is just a fad and it will disappear in a few years and so forth and there are a lot of famous people which have not seen this trajectory um, at its at its inception um, and then on the other hand we are now at the point with blockchain technology where all the most important investors in the world they're in all the most important universities they're in all the most important governments are researching and looking very closely all the most important banks startups businesses and so forth it's not a discussion anymore whether this is for real or not it's only a discussion of what's the opportunity for us how can we create something benefit and and help um, this entire evolution to to move in the maybe fastest and most productive way for the entire society I found Benjamin uh, an old uh, article on um, the biggest Italian newspaper it was like a 1995 or 1997 article and the title was internet is over 95% of websites are basically not they don't get any visitors and the rest is born basically that was you know the statement it's over it's done <laughs> guys it's over <laughs> and it's crazy when you when you go back and you think wow i mean but in that moment i mean yeah probably it was right you know it's it's difficult to to predict and uh, to have a complete uh, vision of a, of a phenomenon but I would say that in this moment, uh, we are that the I mean the uh, crypto ecosystem is so huge, it's so big that it's very difficult to. Um, I mean everything is possible, but imagining that everything will be shut down and go to zero and we go back, you know, 
uh, at, in, in the old ways, I think is, uh, is um, basically impossible. Also because, I don't know what you think about it, but if I think about uh, relationship that, for instance, people have with their own banks, it's not a happy relationship. We're not talking about going back to a great, fantastic relationship with your bank and you say, wow, that's great. Uh, no, you're not happy. So it's uh, kind of easy. You're not going back to, you know, you, you love Marvel and you watch the, the, the Marvel movies and you think, oh gosh, I really would love to go back watching those movies. No, it's a horror movie. So it's kind of easy if you have a better alternative yeah. that is cheaper, faster, i mean, come on. So I, I think people should be more fact-based when they think about these topics. And, and uh, again, two things that always help put things in perspective are, one, that technologies cannot uh, um, achieve mass adoption overnight. Like any fundamental technology, however Uh, uh, good it is, requires time, yeah. requires understanding, requires effort, requires a lot of iterations until it reaches mass adoption. And so um, uh, if you think about it, we'll, we're very likely in a moment similar to the 96-97 moment in the early internet um, era, where we're at this point probably something like 100 to 200 million people in the blockchain space, and we're 8 billion people around the world. Now, now think of how large and massive this opportunity is. How many people um, are not even aware that this is what it is? Uh, how many people are not even aware about the implications for money, for banking, for artists, for um, tech people, and, and so forth, and how large the ramifications are this is this is why a lot of the discussion right now is about a super cycle that is an opportunity that is uh, outweighs all the other opportunities that people have seen just because of this fundamental breakthrough in in technology and the fact that you mentioned um, meeting with people on the street and them being so excited suggests that this technology spreads very, very differently than the normal technologies. Like people discover yeah. that for the first time they can own part of the internet. How cool and insane is that? I mean, e anyone would want something like that, right? Also because the internet at the beginning, the promise was uh, for a new way of connecting and uh, going out of uh, traditional media and control and... Uh, Monopoly and, 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 and so on. And then somehow we moved back with, you know, five, seven companies that control social media, e-commerce. So if you leave the internet at the beginning, it was a different uh, vibe. And it's the same vibe that you find in crypto today. So th I think that's, that's very interesting. I wonder um, uh, how country, countries will play this uh, game, not only financially, but for instance, um, i, I told you I went on to, to Italy on holidays and uh, and I thought how Italy could uh, could you know leverage NFTs for instance to promote the made in Italy brand. We have so many companies and incredible um, skills in different sectors uh, and they are often unknown, you know? So I, I was thinking, uh, I don't know, I was thinking if it's probably possible for countries to think about the strategy also for this. 100%. Uh, I mean, this is the, the right kind of question that is extremely productive to think about, whether people are uh, like government officials, Uh, central bank officials, bank officials, business officials, or um, startups, builders of any kind. This, I think, is the most important question. How can I create something or benefit of this technology? Because when I move toward this part, things become like the right and relevant things become um, very clear and the irrelevant things disappear. Um, and Two, two or three points I, I would mesh, mention uh, regarding this. Um, generally, I think we'll see two different games played at a grand geopolitical scale. Uh, first, a kind of Mexican standoff, 
where most of the relevant countries pretend this sort of does not exist or what? it's irrelevant or overstated as value and so forth. And then all of a sudden, things will shift to an arms race. Like there's a point at which when the first uh, one of the largest um, countries in the world or one of the most um, productive, economically powerful countries in the world makes a move, at that point, you don't have a way of saying no anymore. It's, yep. it's just about how fast can I move to have a space in this digital world to play a role in this digital world. And then the, the second element is in the next three to five years, um, I believe we're going to see several crypto networks. Um, and uh, among them, Elrond as well, that will outweigh the GDP of the different countries they were founded in, which right. is Insane. going to change a lot of things, right? Societally, people will start earning their money on the internet, living their life on the internet in different virtual spaces and having fun and so forth. And it will create a lot of opportunities. Of course, we should be very careful not to, to reach a, a ready player one world where we're yeah. only uh, living in a sort of dystopian version of the future and so forth. But the opportunities are there and the countries that think about it, like Italy and other countries in Europe and Romania and so forth, have an opportunity that is extremely unique. And um, the more they look into it, the more they can bring a lot of value to the citizens of those countries. What would you do if you were in Italy who is Draghi, the prime minister, or if you are Boris Johnson in UK, what would you do? I, I would buy probably like 10 billion Bitcoin. And if it plays well, you repay the public debt and that's it, you know, <laughs> kind of easy. Anyway, you, you throw away 10 billion, I mean, easily if you are a country like Italy or another country. So no, what would you do? If they call uh, you and say, look, we need, we need a strategy. What, what, what are we going to do with this NFT, crypto, everything? This is, this is, again, a very good question. The idea is, I think, um, to do several things. Uh, one, one of the simplest would indeed be to take a large chunk of money that is like out of the uh, budgets that you have, one, two, three yeah. percent. This is nothing in the grand Famous. scheme of things, but would give you an edge that could be insane for the population, for that particular country. So having a portfolio with exposure for uh, as a first step, that's great. Second, creating a regulation so that the smartest people in the world that are building these things come in your country, uh, start creating things in your country, start sharing them in the education system, in the startup system and um, investment sector is again, extremely important because it means that you'll have a lot of spillover effects um, in all the, all the parts that you, that you um, see um, around the tech sector and economy. And then third, what, what, um, what's the most ambitious thing perhaps is build a version of a blockchain network that um, is extremely advanced and if that succeeds, you know that um, in the next period, it will overtake the GDP of your country as a network. It will give the people a new type of future that they can be part of, they can explore, experiment with. And it's not an either or value proposition. So you mm. still improve many things, but uh, it's almost like with blockchains, you have a cheat. A, a hack that right. that does not does not happen usually in real life that you get the resources to solve then all the other problems then you can ask if resources are not a problem what's the most pressing problem i want to solve and right. um this is why resources are the most important problem first because then you can afford to spend on the other problems as well 
One thing that I don't understand, Benjamin, help me to to make up my mind, is um, the, the the blockchains. How many blockchains will survive? Because if I think about uh, internet protocols, HTTP is, is one protocol. You don't have like millions of protocols. I mean, for that job is the protocol that we use, or FTP, or I don't know. So mm-hmm. how does it work with, with blockchains? Um, you, you imagine that we'll have um, thousands of different blockchains, will be one blockchain, will be a blockchain for every uh, specific sector. How does it work? Um, this is, this is um, important to think about. And there are several, um, let's say, schools of thought or approaches here. One, uh, which I think is very simplistic and and um, the the least interesting is that um, for some reason just one blockchain takes off all the other all of a sudden die off um, and it's not clear why that one seem in a single fashion would take off and why the other ones would die off um, on the other hand if you zoom out and look over the longer term it's clear that you have several use cases that you want to optimize for. And not all use cases are equal. Not your use cases require the same architecture. Um, And the parallel to the internet would be that here in the internet, you had several protocols for different use cases. You had SMTP for email, and then you had some other services that were built on different other protocols. Of course, you could say that we're going to have the internet of value and the internet of value in the grand scheme of things should be built on one blockchain or maybe a better way of looking at it is having a kind of meta chain that connects all the blockchains or enables you to interact with the other blockchains. Because if you have interoperability across the ecosystem, then it's very, very simple. What I would say, um, on the other hand, and um, I I do think will be extremely important, um, is blockchains that have no value, that have not created any kind of innovation and are just there trying to, uh, let's say, pretend that they brought something, Mm -hmm. but there's no real um, substance to it. Those will disappear. It's very simple. To the extent that the community discovers the reality, they will move forward. On the other hand, fundamental breakthroughs um, that will enable people to essentially move money, as I said, in an instant, anywhere in the world at a trivial cost, and then be able to have NFTs and DeFi and so forth, which are just applications of the same principles. Um, That blockchain that succeeds in doing this will take a lot of the um, great opportunity that we see ahead. And here, this is one of the elements. This is why we've we've built Elrond and we've spent so much time in bringing this breakthrough to market. But then on the other hand, the second most important thing that's um, crucial is what adoption do we have? Because at the right. end of the day, the entire market cap is only a function of number of users. If this is the entire market we have, then it's a small market. Like this is everything we have. This is why the question is, how will we be able to bring the new users in? What new services that are super exciting, super compelling, that bring us new relationships to, as you said, um, our money, our assets, our time, Um, And if they bring us, uh, will we see a rapid adoption unlike anything we've seen in the world before? Um, I I think this is very likely. And this is why we've spent a lot of energy in Elrond, not only on the performance problem, but the UX problem. Because if we can create it, um, like simplify the entire interaction, at that point, we can speak the language of the normal user the user on the street um, and and the average internet user. And this is where uh, the largest opportunity is. How many people are working at the moment on on um, Aaron and, and how many developers? I, I give it for granted, but maybe people don't know. 
So the, I, I think a few metrics that are important to have in mind is um, Elrond can scale. Uh, Elrond is built on two important breakthroughs. One is adaptive state charting. And it's this idea that you can, instead of um, processing transactions in a serialized manner, you can divide and conquer. So you take a network, split it into several networks, you can parallelize transaction processing. And as an effect, you can, of course, process dramatically more than any other network. Um, and so the, the second breakthrough is secure proof of stake. Just as we said, efficiency, computational efficiency, and security are part of it. And then we have 3,200 nodes distributed around the world that sustain and maintain the security of the network. Those nodes are um, essentially rewarded for the security they provide on, on the network uh, with the eGold native token. And uh, we have, even in the Myra application, about half a million users. Uh, we have around 800,000 accounts within the network at this point, and around um, 80 people in the team and a few thousands of people contributing from around the world, whether it's developers, community, and so forth, and a few hundreds of thousands that are contributing, again, within the community with, uh, with different aspects. So it's absolutely fascinating how early we are, how large the opportunity is, and uh, this also gives, gives us the, let's say, fire to, to push as hard as possible and um, uh, bring even more users in and services for them. We went super long with our, our chat, but it was so interesting. And I have a final uh, topic I wanted to touch with you, which is automotive and, and blockchain, because I know that, that you were doing something interesting there, a partnership. Um, yes. So the, the idea is, again, blockchain enables transactions that can happen automatically between machines. So this is fundamental for autonomous vehicles. Uh, autonomous vehicles, if you think about them, like your car will drive from home, go and charge itself, uh, it will need to pay automatically and then move to the next step. Now, in order to do this securely and efficiently, you can use blockchains. And this is insanely more um, efficient and secure than anything we've had before. So this is one element. And then the second element is um, of course, our discussion with Holoride, uh, which combines this idea of a blockchain and the metaverse and says, what if instead of wasting your time in a car or a vehicle of any kind, when you have a long drive, what if you would just put some goggles on and would start exploring the world, would start uh, playing with your friends, meet with them in the metaverse, um, maybe working something, maybe creating some value, exchanging that value in different ways. Um, and when you start thinking about it like that, um, whole ride essentially changes the way people will look at rides, at any travel ride. So we're, uh, of course, excited about them. And uh, it's just one of the examples of uh, where you'll see the technology take off really fast. That's interesting. Um, I, I like to <clears throat> talk about Holoride to, to my kids that during the ride, they, they are my Holoride in the travel, you know? It's like a virtual reality, but in real life. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it, definitely. It was really, really interesting and, in, and inspiring. Thank you so much and uh, good luck for everything. It was really great having the conversation and uh, would love to, to follow up and have you uh, visit us at Elrond. So. Awesome. Oh, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>